Thank you, Lee, for the introduction. Good morning to our Outlook delegates. In this session, I will present ABIS latest modeling work on global food demand and supply to 2050 and some simulation results on policy issues that can influence food prices to 2050. As you all heard from Paul Morris in the previous session, he has stolen my thunder by telling you that we are not projecting a significant rise in food prices to 2050. Well, I can assure you that is only part of the story. At the last year's outlook, ABS presented its projections of global food demand by 2050 based on the United Nations population projections and a set of assumptions on global per person income growth by country and region. In that modeling work, world food demand is projected to increase by over 75% between 2007 and 2050. Demand is projected to increase most strongly in Asia doubling between 2007 and 2050. In particular, China is expected to drive the demand growth, accounting over 40% of the increase in global food demand. India is expected to account for an additional 13%. The projected increase in global food demand to 2050 is welcome news to our primary producers. But associated with this projection, there are several questions to be answered. For example, will this projected increase in global food demand lead to significantly higher world food prices? This question is of particular interest to primary producers, especially if we take into account the challenges facing agriculture going forward, including resource constraints and climate change. These factors are likely to impact on agricultural productivity growth, especially over the longer term. On the other hand, changes in government policies, such as those relating to trade and the use of food crops for biofuel productions can also affect global food prices. With food security at the forefront of many governments' policy agendas, ABS has undertaken further modeling to highlight the impact on global food prices to 2050 across a number of supply-side scenarios. These scenarios reflect possible constraints and challenges that primary producers around the world will likely face. Using a set of assumptions on agricultural production worldwide, such as productivity growth by region and commodity, land availability by country and region, taken from international organizations and the assessments by ABS scientists and economists, we have produced a reference scenario of global food prices to 2050 based on our modeling results. 
For those who are interested in the assumptions used in our modeling, you will find discussion in an ABA paper for this conference titled Global Food Production and Prices to 2050. I welcome you to read the paper and will appreciate your comments for us to fine tune the model results. In this reference scenario, world food prices are on average are projected to be around 11.5% higher by 2050 in real terms compared with prices in 2007. To put this projection into perspective, you may be interested to know that world food prices in real terms rose by 10.8% between 2007 and 2012. This increase was due largely to adverse seasonal conditions in some major producing countries pushing up world prices. So using recent movements in food prices as a guide, what we are projecting in this reference scenario is that world food prices in real terms by 2050 will be just slightly higher than their average in 2012. By 2050, we are projecting more significant price rises for fish, meat, cereals, and OUC oils. The most significant price rise is projected for fish and fish products. This reflects an assessment that little growth will be achieved for wild catch fisheries. The growth in fishery production to 2050 will mainly from expansions in aquaculture. Of course, an important question for Australian producer is what opportunities will there be for Australian agriculture? To answer that question, we'll have a look at the projected food consumption by region. The most significant growth in food consumption is projected to be in the Asian region, with food consumption doubling over the next 40 years or so. Now, what about domestic food production in Asia? One important finding in our modeling is that food production in Asia is also expected to increase significantly to 2050. This is because many Asian countries have a greater potential to increase agricultural production, leading to significant increase in food productivity and food production. These results suggest that there will be competition to sell Australian food exports to Asia, not only with other food exporting countries, but also with domestic production in Asia. However, what Asia will produce towards 2050 is unlikely to be sufficient to meet the increase in Asian food demand. So the next question is what will Asia want? As demonstrated by the slide, there will be a need for Asia to increase its imports of meat, vegetables, fruit, dairy products, cereals, and some other food products such as sugar. Now given this reference scenario I just presented, let me now turn to the simulation results on the impact of some policy issues on food prices. The first issue we have looked at is a scenario of a trade liberalization. In this scenario, we made the assumption that government policy interventions on food production and consumptions as measured 
by the producer and consumer support estimates will be eliminated beginning by 2020 and completed by 2040. Because the removal of policy interventions will allow an improvement in allocation of resources, we also assume that there will be an increase of 5% in annual agricultural productivity growth from 2030 onward in this scenario. Now let me elaborate a little more on this point. In the reference case, we have adopted an assessment that global agricultural productivity growth will decline from the rate of around 2% a year over the past few decades to an average of around 1% a year to 2050. Now, if you add in this assumed increase of 5% to the productivity growth assumption, what we did in this simulation was to increase the growth rate of agricultural productivity from 1% to 1.05% uh, from 2030 onward. It is also important to keep in mind that not all government interventions on food production and consumption are captured by the producer and consumer support estimates used in this model. Under these assumptions, world food production is projected to be 86% higher by 2050 than in 2007 in this scenario. This compares with the increase of 75% in the reference case. Under this scenario, world food prices in real terms are projected to be 10.4% higher in 2050 compared with 2007. This is actually lower than the rise of 11.5% in the reference case. It is noteworthy if the increase in productivity growth induced by these policy changes is sustained, then global food prices will be much lower than in the reference case beyond 2050. Of course, of interest to us is what will be the impact to, on Australian agriculture. For Australia, the projected increase in this scenario for Australian food production by 2050 is 86% compared with 2007. This is about 10 percentage points higher than in the reference case. For Australian food exports, the projection is an increase of 166 percent by 2050 compared with 2007, 24 percentage points higher than the in, uh, reference case. Now to examine the issue of using food crops for biofuel production, we have experimented with the model by reducing the amount of maize that is projected for ethanol production in the United States. The model results indicate that the reducing maize used in U.S. ethanol production can have a significant impact on world maize prices. Under a scenario of a 50% reduction in maize used for U.S. ethanol production to 2050, the world price of maize in real terms is projected to be at around the same level by 2050 as in 2007. Any reduction of more than 50% will lead to lower maize prices in real terms by 2050. We also experimented with sun sensitivity analysis in order to examine the relationship between food prices and some key variables such as agricultural productivity growth, land availability, and possible rainfall deficiency caused by climate change. 
to undertake these simulations, what we have done is to increase the total factor productivity growth assumption used in the model by 10% from 1% to 1.1% a year to 2050. For land availability, we increased the land available to agricultural production worldwide by 10%. For rainfall deficiency, we reduced the growth assumption for crop yields and resulted in a reduction of land productivity growth from an average of 1.1% to 0.8% a year. The simulation results indicate that the movements in world food prices to 2050 are relatively sensitive to the rate of increase we can achieve for agricultural productivity and how significant will climate change impact on rainfall and crop yields in the future. In conclusion, let me present you with a few take home messages. First, in our reference case, world food prices in real terms are not projected to increase significantly towards 2050 from current levels because food prices have already reached relatively high levels. This result is based on currently available information and the assessment on agricultural productivity growth and resource constraints toward 2050. This implies that continued reform to improve the competitiveness of Australian agriculture remains important for sustaining growth in the sector. Second, there are significant market opportunities in Asia for Australian agriculture toward 2050, but there will also be competition and challenges. Competition can be expected not only from other exporting countries, but also from domestic production in Asia. Our modeling results also highlight the impact government policy can have on food prices. Successful conclusion of trade liberalization negotiations will not only ensure the flow of food to where it is needed, but also reduce upward pressure on food prices by inducing higher productivity growth. Our results also emphasize the significance of improvements in agricultural productivity to meet higher global food demand toward 2050. Productivity growth will improve the ability of producers to cope with the challenges associated with climate change and land and water constraints. This concludes my presentation. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for their support to this project. Thank you.